I just wonder if it's tough not to be Star Trek Six. I mean, I, I know, you know, you guys struggled with Next Generation when you were doing stories like, you know, global warming to do the, the warp speed limit that was destroying the universe, right, the yeah. fabric of the right, universe. That, that's an unsuccessful Star Trek episode. But the more successful <laughs> one is the... Is it? Well, no, it, here's why. I can't remember what it was called. Um, Scott? Uh, I, <laughs> we find out that warp engines right. are destroying right. the fabric of space, and it was a, an analogy for pollution or global warming. Mm -hmm. The reason that that episode is a bore, in my opinion, is that, that there is no allegory. It is on the nose. It's right, right it out. is right, a right. fastball down the middle, it right and it feels preachy. Suddenly, yeah. you're not deriving the meaning from the episode. The meaning right. is clobbering you over the head. Right. That's not a successful Star Trek episode, and they're not all successful. But that's why I, I was going to say that the undiscovered country is is on the nuts. I, I feel of it, it's just so it beats you over the head with with the fall of the. Uh, yeah, and yet there are good the aspects to it. I, I thought that, that that they took a, a, a risk with Kirk kind of being racist. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that was the strength of it, and they didn't need a whole lot more. Uh, the, the the politics got a little bit. But yeah, getting him to that place of you know I'm wrong about this. I couldn't see past my own bigotry. That's yeah. always a great moment for one of the Star Trek characters to have because it means, you know, these are your heroes. And, and particularly when it's your lead. Flawed, and they're flawed. And you know, it's not some supporting character. It's right. the main guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hope we get to the point where we can talk about the latest movie. And no, if it's we're not. A success <laughs> and if it's a successful Star Trek. Because we will talk about that, yeah. but I want to. I want to. I want to. I want to explore so the foundation before we get to the yeah. building. So uh, <laughs> it relates to all this, but yeah. Uh, because you know this. This again. I'm. I'm just thinking of things right here. Um, you know, we talked a lot about the allegory, which has been written about ad nauseum. But one of the things that doesn't get talked about is the fact that you know, in the 50s and early 60s. People were afraid of technology. They were afraid of where technology was taking us. Certainly, after seeing Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know the the, the human uh, ability to create things and destroy things uh, was sort of seemed unlimited. I think and, to some degree they still are with cloning and just well. But but here's food. the thing. I think Star Trek made people more comfortable with technology, but and I think it paved the way because and I think that and we've talked about this. You know, kids who are growing up watching it in repeats don't understand what it was like for us who were younger who watched. Star Trek. I mean, something as miraculous as the doors opening and closing. We didn't have those in supermarkets at the time. You know, it was only in the mid '70s where you know you started to see that everywhere in the barcode scanning and all that. But you know, whether it be something as simple as the iPad or you know space tourism, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Star Trek really. Or, I or losing your job to a computer. Or, or a machine, right. And, you know, that was always yeah. a big thing. Uh, you know, and uh, I mean, <laughs> what's amazing is dated as the, the Spock slipping the little discs into the computer. Right. What's funny is that. Technology caught caught up with Star Trek and, and then passed it all within yeah. you know the span of a couple of decades. Yeah. You know that the original Star Trek sort of looks primitive in that regard because we've we've superseded it so much. So I wonder, is there any truth to the fact that you know Star Trek has really sort of put people, I think, made people a lot more comfortable with technology, that it has affected technology. And certainly, I mean, if you look at somebody like um, uh, SpaceX, uh, the, the X Prize. Um, Elon Musk. Elon Musk. He, he has an award now for, I think I read in Geek, um, shameless plug, for um, a, a tricorder, for the person who can that's, create a that's tricorder. That's X Prize. Yeah. Yeah, the tricorder X Prize through Qualcomm. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And they've got hundreds of teams, actually, from around the world competing in this thing. It's it's. I, I agree with you. I, I, I definitely think it's it's made it more comfortable. But I get worried because technology is moving at such a fast rate. I mean, almost exponentially. Where the point there, there's so much new stuff coming out. A, it's hard to keep up, and B, yeah. I think the same fear is coming back. And I think the genetically modified food is not necessarily a bad thing, depending on who's doing it. And then they're doing the labeling. I mean, we well, they're not doing the labeling. Well, so they're not doing the labeling, <laughs> well, which that. which I'm a little scared of. But I was also scared of the labeling because people just hear genetically modified food, and I think a majority instantly think Frankenstein. Genetically modified food can be good. In oh, fact, we've been doing it for it years. Seeds, seeds billions. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Which so, is becoming more and more an issue. And people have to become more educated on this, and it's getting harder and harder to understand. Right, Star Trek also probably, I only know this anecdotally, inspired people's interest in science yeah, definitely. and technology. And that's, I think, more important. You know, you, you do meet people who got into engineering or 
whatever field of science because they grew up watching Star Trek. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. I was just going to say, you, I mean, you guys obviously haven't worked on Star Trek here a lot. I recently had an experience at a convention where some kid came up to me uh, about free enterprise, and he said at the time I was failing at school and I was doing, you know, I don't hear these kind of stories, and 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 and, and all this stuff. And he comes up and he says, um, he says, you know, my parents wouldn't let me watch anything. They said you can watch one thing, and he said, so free enterprise was the only thing I was allowed to watch, and 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 he said, and it. I changed my, it changed my life. I mean, like, and and you know, which is amazing because for me, Star Trek was such a big influence on me growing up. That to hear that, uh, you know, about Free Enterprise, which is you know, sort of a slight romantic comedy, it's fun, for, you know. Uh, but it, to, to hear the kind of stories that I know you guys have heard hundreds of times, it, thousands of times, about the influence of Star Trek on people was really it was amazing. And I was actually you know really touched by the story that this you know how kid told. So I'm, um, but. Um, uh, but it's it's remarkable, and I, I'm sure you've heard this more than anybody about how you know people become doctors and engineers and and things like that. It's 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 it shocked the hell out of me. I mean, it really it it always has. It's amazing how much how many people it influenced. I still don't believe it because you know going back and watching the episodes, a lot of them I you know I I, I think I think I get it. At least I, I I pull something out of it on my own. But I'm like wow, and so many people were affected by this, you know. And again, I think it's what you said earlier being a product of that generation. You know, right. I'm, not, I'm a product of the next generation and the series, the next generation. So, But I think that, that in general, like, you know, in terms of technology passing some, things like the next gen and the original show, I, I think that, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think people look back, and especially now that next gen is celebrating its 25th anniversary, with, like, warmness and kindness and, and nostalgia, uh, you know, if you watch, I think now, if you watch both of those shows, and the old one especially, because it has such a simplistic look to it with the primary colors and it's retro, you know, and uh, it, it, you know, back when they were making the original series, no one knew what a Star Trek was, you know, it didn't have a following yet. So the only thing that really propelled it were, was the writing and, and the actors. Well, I also think they did a great man's Speaking exactly what you're saying is like also there's something about the original design of that show and that ship that everything when they couldn't be specific they weren't so you have buttons that aren't labeled so there's a way in which you can still enjoy that show it's when they got really specific that it's like oh that's not how it worked but everything is so <laughs> sort of abstract in terms of what's going on and what those controls are there isn't a throttle there isn't a so there's a way in which that allows you to sort of suspend disbelief and I think it's one I, of the reasons I, I, I the show has, has moved on I, I'm speaking the obvious here that some of the design elements, like the ship itself, were so groundbreaking, yeah. so advanced. I mean, right. up to that point, it was rocket ship yeah. kind of stuff. Or, or flying saucer. Yeah, flying Gordon now. On a, a ship yeah. right. with this military vessel, whatever prototype it was, is still, you can't beat it. You, the essential design of the Enterprise hasn't changed. Neil deGrasse Tyson was at your Starship uh, count, Smackdown thing, and I saw that video on YouTube, and he's talking exactly about that, about the idea that, like, <laughs> who you're working That's with right. on Cosmos, but that. The design, you look at the design of Enterprise, which we take for granted, you think about it in the context of time, exactly what you're saying. It was rocket ships, it was flying saucers, and now there's this thing with the engines up here and the things yeah. down there, and it's like that and the bridge, and it's, you know, it's, it still holds up. It's still a great design. There's a reality to, to, to yeah. the original series, too, that the other shows carry forward. A lot of science fiction up to that point on television, I right. think if you thought how ships work, this had a warp field. I mean, some thought right. went into right. Look at Lost in Space. Of the ship, the ship and how it worked. There was an engine room that you saw. I mean, that was very new for that time. But it was also, to make it accessible, you know, you had a captain, a uh, first officer, a lieutenant, you know. Naval does. The, mil it the was military in, structure. Naval terms made it very accessible, even to somebody you know, somebody really young who I, didn't know I what these this, terms were. I remember this episode of the Time Tunnel, which I, it was not a record show with Erwin <laughs> Allen, and, and, they're, and they're, they've, it's one of the episodes where they go to the future, and they're trying to figure out how the computer works, and there are these things, these rectangle things on the wall, and, they're, and then the, the, the lead character figures out, oh, wait a second, these are punch cards. These are computer punch cards. And it's like the, yeah, it was like so limited in its thinking of that. Like computers at that time, which used these paper punch cards. In the future, they'll be plastic. That's the advance, you know. And Star Trek never thought that that literally. They never, well, they, they they never they stopped that they, literally. It, with the, with it, the, this 
I think continued. It was a lot of the technology was abstract, right, and therefore was not dated. Right. Yeah. Well, the the book, The Making of Star Trek, uh, was was actually a great book, and that's where I learned a great deal about how my father and the other the other people on the on the production staff would contact JPL and Caltech, and and I think one story that's in there is is simply about the phaser. Where my father sort of said, you know, we wrote a letter and said we need we need a weapon. I don't know if he said we don't need it to kill, but whatever the case is, the response was, well, you know, right now we're working on lasers. And my father said, so what's the next step, or what might be an evolution of that? Mm -hmm. And of course, it was the phasing laser, and that's where the phaser came from. And look, that's ability was was a very important part. In fact, yeah. in the, the 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 Bible, the 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 writing document for the for the original series. There's a whole paragraph on believability where my father talks about how important it is to, to make things believable. People don't realize this, but that was a really groundbreaking book. There hadn't been a lot of books like that. that, that I mean, it's like the granddaddy of behind the scenes. Books. Totally. Well, I mean, you look at like Hitchcock, Truffaut. Had, by the way. Uh, right. I, exactly. I didn't know that. There, I learned. I became a TV writer because of that book because I didn't even know the job existed. Like you're you're watching television. And you don't stop to think about the fact that these people words, made this. That yeah. somebody wrote every word yeah. that's coming out of uh, Hawkeye Pierce's mouth. Mm -hmm. It's not just Kirk. It's like somebody sitting down and writing. And that book like opened my mind. Oh my that's God, this a, is a job? I, I can do this as a job? I will also tell you from a fetishistic point of view, that is the greatest shot of the Enterprise ever. That sort cover. of looking up at the Enterprise with the blue phasers I firing. Think, yeah. It has yeah. never looked better than in that picture. But more importantly, um, <laughs> that, uh, that, um, that book is really remarkable because it was not, I mean, stuff like Carl Gottlieb's The Jaws Log, which came 10 years later, these things didn't exist. Right. And uh, it Twilight gave you such Zone insight, Zone. Twilight Zone Companion by Mark Sakat's <laughs> Creed. These things didn't exist until <laughs> That was a long time. That was a little while later. Much uh, later. Yeah, much later. Much was later. Stephen Whitfield on the set, like you know. He, he was on or, the set, or whatever his real was, name uh, was. Was he was an advertising copywriter, right? What, it, what was his name? Stephen Edward Post. Right? Yeah, I knew. I knew who. The, and then David Gerald did a really interesting book about the making of Trouble with Tribbles, which is a whole book just about writing yeah, the Trouble with Tribbles, and it had excerpts from the script, which is the first time I think I'd ever seen a script. Right. Uh, you I know. got that book at the same time I got photo novel number nine, which is. The oh, remember the photo novel? Oh, photo novel. we could do a whole panel just on photo yeah, novel. Yeah, yeah. Now this may be before your time, yeah, but before VHS, right before VHS, before yeah. VHS, and you, you look, you we probably got Bel Air prints at your house, so you don't know a photo novels. You know, you get the screening room and everything, but. We, growing up, could not relive the things that we loved yeah, because, like so either you went into the movie theater with a fucking cassette recorder and taped the movie, you know, or your TV, or you get these photo novels. Oh, and wow. Star Trek was the first thing to have photo novels. Yes. This was before they came out with Nightwing, yep. you know, and some of the other movies of the time. And it was basically stills from the show with word balloons. Um, and I, what, Piece of the Action was like Piece the first? Piece of the Action was number eight. Level <laughs> Dark was nine. One Geek. was City. Two was Where No Man Has Gone Before, three was Trouble with Tribbles, four was a, was, uh, uh, a Taste of Arm Again, five was Metamorphosis, How many six, are there? wait, six, no, there's only 12. <laughs> oh, six we can remember all night if he keeps going. Two, seven, <laughs> wait, seven was The Galileo, seven, believe you, Scott. eight was Peace of the Action, nine was Devil in the Dark, ten was Day of the Dog, eleven was The Deadly Years, twelve was A Mock Time. Wow, that's very, I, I don't know if that's impressive or pathetic. <laughs> but um, all the also, movies, Star popular. Trek, no, no, motion picture was a photo. Novel. Yes, except right. it was in, no, that wasn't color. And then Star Trek Two was in black and white. That's when they started cheaping out. Oh. So, um, but anyway, There's the not point much being, of an age gap though between us. <laughs> Just well, key years. I'm 40, well, 43. 43. Oh, it's not that. I'm 29. You'll be. <laughs> no shit. Wow, you don't look good. Thank you. But yeah, the photo novel was an interesting phenomenon. It was the bridge between sort of a certain era and then the dawn of VHS. Yeah. And and then of course you know right. DVD and everything. But it also spoke to just you know what Star Trek fans I think which separated us from other TV fans is that we really wanted to watch those things over and over and there was a way which I think too that like. There was something again about what uh, Rod's dad created and the writers he worked with, in that they created this. They didn't fill in all the blanks. Like uh, the, there's a way in which the, the Federation and Starfleet did. They sort of drop hints about the history and they drop hints about, you know, and that it, it. You wanted to like be a part of this. You wanted to know all the details that weren't even in the 
in the shows, you were always re-watching the episodes, looking for more details and trying to fill in the blanks of this world they created. And I think that's what led to people wearing costumes and really just participating. It's about creating stories, they, you know, and the fanzines and stuff. It's because similar to Sherlock it's, Holmes fans who did the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think that um, Michael Chabon wrote a, a great thing about fan fiction and uh, a great essay about this, that it's like, popular fiction does this thing where it creates this world and it doesn't fill in the blanks and that means that the fans want to and that that creates websites and that creates um fanzines when we were kids fanzines. it was like self-published stories yeah, it's yeah. like we want to participate it creates a, a and there was some start way in which star trek i think really was the first television series to do that there have obviously been now others like x files or firefly uh, firefly you know where people want to participate buffy you know, I think the, the, the fan television, fan television created by fans like Joss Whedon, mm -hmm. who are fans of things like this, pop culture, things like this, they created. And, but Star Trek, I think, was really the first TV series to do that. Well, it's also, you know, interesting that things now work on such a meta level because shows are being created by fans who are right. fans. Right. Whereas, you know, Gene Roddenberry, you know, came out of the military, he worked on The Lieutenant, right. Right. which recently came out, which is an interesting show. It is. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting show to watch. Uh, and now you have a generation, you know, like Joss, who, right. you know, are fa fans, of, you know, who are now, you know, creating stuff that for another generation to be right. fans of. Exactly. Um, is so. it, isn't it similar though? My, my father I know read John Cutter of Mars and a number of those classic sort of sci-fi yeah. novels. It is. And was a fan of those. Yeah. I don't think they, you know, that kind of fandom just didn't exist back when, when he was a little boy. So. I think there was a way, harder way for people to find each other. I mean, that's, yeah, I think, yeah. the other thing that changed. Television creates a community uh, just by, by being on at the same yeah. time and then through school or through, you know, social interaction. That And now the Internet creates this way that people can interact moment to moment about uh, the thing, the interests that they share. Back then, you were buying a fanzine or you're buying a pulp magazine at the store you're at home alone reading it you know you know there's no there's no way to connect to anybody else and find out oh i'm not alone this is i share this interest with other people and that's that the information age changed that i think another great thing about star trek it's like being in that room and uh it's like being in this room with me right here and people are talking about all these things you don't know about and finally someone raises their hands and says, i don't understand and they're all like oh good i didn't either <laughs> I, 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 I think star trek in a way and i'm just pulling this out of thin air listening to you you know we've heard that it sort of appealed to people who felt different and people who felt really sort of excluded from the normal everyday uh i, I guess uh society and so i, I wonder if I, you know, I wonder, you said in the 70s, it, it did start getting popular. Yeah. Didn't it really start on college campuses? Didn't, wasn't well, it the college well, students? The, when, when the yes. show went off the air in its <clears> first <throat> run, the first station that started airing it nightly in syndication was actually in Philadelphia. And it was in 1969. And, you know, within a few years, uh, other affiliates throughout the country started airing it five nights a week. You know, when it was on in first run, it was on once a week on NBC. And, you know, the, the popular myth is that it did horrible in the ratings and it was a failure and it's every year they have to fight to keep it on. But the target demo was there. They were the ones who wrote in after the end of the second Which Which's funny, if it was on now, with those demographics, it would be it would considered be a much bigger success you know, but they didn't because have it was the demo that yeah. system that looked at demos like they do now. I mean, that show would never have gone off the air. You know, okay. If they knew we well, let, let, let's talk about one more thing before we get to the state of Star Trek today, which is the idea, and this has been talked about a lot, of the multiculturalism of Star Trek, and you know, we you know all about the first uh, interracial kiss, with, um, but. You know, in a way, that multiculturalism has that paved the way for the first African American president. I mean, it sounds like big, but it showed people working together. And at the time, people, you, you didn't see that kind of stuff. I mean, we still lived in a very segregated culture. And, you know, I mean, I always remember, I don't remember, it may have been in the making of Star Trek where somebody was some racist from the South wrote in and said something about, you know, I always, you know, was very racist about things. But when I saw that Nichelle Nichols on the bridge of the Enterprise, she was damn hot. I didn't care what color she was. So I just, um, you Great know, accent, I, by the way. yeah, thanks. So uh, anyway, um, so I wonder, and, and in a way, you know, jumping 
forward to the next generation, did that make uh, therapy palatable for a whole new generation? <laughs> you know, it's sort of mainstream, you know, uh, the idea of the therapist on, on board. The therapist in a, on a ship full of characters that supposedly had gone beyond human foibles and no longer succumbed to petty jealousies and <laughs> anger. Why is there a th therapist on board? <laughs> Rod? <laughs> I'm guessing for all those other planets we go to, really. Sure. It's sense what the other person uh, is feeling. That's a good point. Though. I don't know. I, I, I feel sort of <laughs> that, you know. I feel. That, uh, I think that the, the multiculturalism, so, I mean, I think it was great because of the time that you had um, an African American and an Asian and this fake Russian uh, <laughs> on the bridge of the Enterprise. Yeah. but. The white, the white American guy was still in charge. So I think that there's a way in which I think that that. But that, that was, that was the '60s. Well, I know. When you go next generation, white European guy, white American guy, still in charge. I mean, you know, I think that yes, it gets better with Deep Space Nine and Voyager. But I think that unfortunately, there's still because it's the business of television that they still put uh, a white guy. The white guy's still in charge. The white, you know, for those. For us white guys, it's great. I think, though, there is still a condescension. You've got to put it in con historical context. Mm -hmm. so, you know, it's what was doesn't seem ground. What seems backward today may be groundbreaking in its time. I don't, yeah. And it's incremental. I mean, it. But I, you I, have to give Star Trek its due. Well, I'll mean, give it. I'll give it its due. It's I mean, great. It, it was but, doing uh, stuff that no one else was doing. No, I, absolutely. But again, you look at Next Generation. The the two black guys. One of them's blind, and one of them's a Klingon. I think that there's still a way in which white people are still writing television and they're still making white people the heroes. It's TV is dominated by white male writers. See, and I would have to say, though, the only thing to me that, you know, that is really jarring about that Star Trek, because I think, is, is the sexism. And not in terms of Kirk sleeping with every available female. That's fine. I have no problem with that. But the, the <laughs> thing is, the, the problem is, is you look at something like Turnabout Intruder, right. where the female is this crazy person, yeah. Harpy, who can't, you know, right. be in command of a starship because she's a woman. Right. That, to me, right. is endemic of, of really where it sort of dropped the ball, so to speak. That line that he says, I'll never forget and turn about true. He goes, it's better to be dead than to be alone in the body of a woman. I mean, that <laughs> yeah, yeah, makes yeah. the episode so dated. But, but see, there, there, are, well, she there, are, there are episodes of the, of the old show that are absolutely dated. That's a shining example of one. Thinking of an episode, again, I know I talk about metamorphosis, Mr. Hepburn is going to stop right. the war. Right. Mr. Hepburn is a right. woman. Yeah, yeah. And, and a trap. No, right. And, there, and, they, and they, there is plenty of, of roles of, you know, do, the doctors, their lawyers, they're, you know, there's a way in which they all seem to have been somehow involved with Kirk, but they... They had their own career. See, what's amazing yeah. to me uh, is, and this is not a product of Gene, because if you look at Gene, he was going to have a woman as second in command. Well, you know, he did they have true. the number well, one that's, that's character. It was Fred Freiberger was who was came up mom. with this absurd, yeah. yeah, it was his mom, yeah. who came up with this ridiculous conceit. Can I just uh, change the subject and say, what's it like to go back and look at, like, the cage and see your mother play that role? I mean, I... And looking really hot. I mean, she, yeah, she uh, well, that's, that's, that It's weird when people say that. Yeah. <laughs> I See, like, Rob Burnett is not here, so I have to take the mantle. Well, what's that like? I mean, you're like, it's your mother. Do you do you see aspects of her? Is she just completely lost in the role? What is that experience? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I seriously, <laughs> I'm like, sorry. I, I literally, I, of course, I've seen well, it, but I, I don't. Well, I saw. You know, you I, had that theater that when you showed Men the Menagerie in the theater, uh, you were there, and oh, I must ask you that, and I. I, well, but there's no way you can sort of even, even like you know. Yeah, it doesn't weird me out or anything. It's it's, it's you just, know it's, it's accepted. This yeah, is who she was. Absolutely. Naked time. Absolutely. It doesn't. When she falls under the when she gets uh, you know the, the disease right. and she like you know is like you know seduced and Spock and right. she just like you know. Okay, that's that's sorry. Weird. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you, uh, Luxana, and we'll get there. Next generation. Right. That's one where I see my mother every time. Because, mm. I mean, because that character that was her. Right. I mean, that was her. The the joke is, or the story is, which sounds like a joke, is that they didn't create the character and then cast my mother. They knew they had to put my mother in, so they just created a character around that's her. Right. Ah, that's so, true. Right. Which that's, is, I love that. from what that's I can true. tell from the character, very true. Right, 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 right. You know, it's interesting, though, for Next Generation to, to sort of redress the issue, you know, the idea of casting... Denise Crosby is the security chief, you know, which is the manly machismo you always associate with, you know, the, the, the guy casting her as the security chief. And it's too bad that that sort of didn't work out because it was an interesting 
way to sort of because she was address. a playboy, right? No, I was. I figure people know more on the actual production staff. I just hear things. Well, like, that was before. I you, get my information from fans. I, I actually don't know. I think she really wanted to leave the show because she was a playboy right? after that. Huh? Yeah. Oh, did she? Yeah, she okay. There were, you know, there were people who, whether it was Denise or um, Will Wheaton or uh, Michelle. Well, Wheaton was a playboy. In a row. They all did playboy. Um, yeah. But uh, they they had, they um, had their sights on movies. Mm -hmm. They were stepping stone to bigger things, yeah. and uh, you know, didn't really turn out that way for a lot of them. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, there was a point at which Star Trek sort of went away, you know, and people were thinking, you know, it had gone fallow in the '70s, you know, but the fans kept it alive. And then there was a point before this new movie where Star Trek had sort of gone away. And and and, and was that the last series before the movie? <laughs> well, a lot of people were a lot of people were saying there were a lot of people saying, "Look, there's too much Star Trek. It, it, it sort of, you know, um, swallowed itself, you know." And then it, 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 people are just, you know, tired and they need a break from Star Trek or whatever. Or other people were saying Star Trek's not relevant today. You know, Star Trek doesn't uh, isn't relevant to a young audience. You know, it's a bunch of you know people who grow up on this stuff or grow up on next gen. But you're and, talking about the end of, of Enterprise, right? You, right. How, the, I mean, you know, I, you, but it could have been I, anything. I, don't know why I keep looking at you, but the CBS well, Paramount show, merger, right. I keep thinking, I mean, that show was doing well in the show third was, and fourth season the show, for sure. The show was not, was not doing as well as people had hoped it would do. It, had a, it started off well. The, I hear nothing but, I mean, great things about it. And, and the ratings declined. Uh, by today's standards, of course, it would be a, a, giant just, a, a massive <laughs> hit. Right. Uh, but you know, it was a combination of things. There was too much start. I think the ratings declined. It was a sharp decline compared to the other shows. Really? Uh, though it was still holding its own. There, I, the reason for that, I would hope, was not the quality of the show. That that may have something to do with it. There was a, it was there was a lot of Star Trek. You know, Rick and I didn't want to do another show so quickly. And it, the Paramount's attitude was, well, if you ain't going to do it, we'll find someone who will. Yeah. Wow. And um, and so it, it was. We put our heart and soul into it, but you can't force people to watch. And I also think, in retrospect, honestly, I don't know that the pe that the people in charge really respected the show all that much or understood. It. And this is they really the first time right. where you had to deal I with a network. It was outrageous that they canceled. Because when you were dealing with shows that were in first run syndication, even with UPN, you weren't getting that kind of. Um, there was no press. Well, look, the Next Generation was the numbers that that show was getting in syndication were jaw dropping. And um, it, it's uh, it's unbelievable. And then you know when you look at like the premiere of Deep Space Nine or Voyager, I can't remember what the the numbers were, but no show. Yeah, it was massive. Now. I mean, it's just crazy. And the TV he, landscape changed. I mean, that's but the TV changed. landscape has completely and changed. It changed. The, rating, while the, 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 while the, the bar are. keeps getting lower and lower for what the ratings are. Um, and you know, it just it, even you know, all shows go away. But not every show whether it's Gunsmoke or I Love Lucy or Star Trek, but right. not every show is Star Trek. Right. Um, and Star Trek is, it, it went away for a while as it needed to, and then it was re reinvented. And if you look at it, um, the, the run that Star Trek had from the beginning of Next Generation to the end of Enterprise was how sort of episodes, unprecedented. How about the beginning of the original series? How many episodes total were done from original series to end of Enterprise? There were like uh, over 700, yeah, so yeah. like it's 790 something. Yeah, episodes, almost 800 Which episodes. is a staggering. It is staggering. Now, by the way, they, 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 I don't think that nothing was recycled. You know, there was always an effort to keep everything new. I don't mm -hmm. think you're going to see a lot of episodes that they maybe resemble another episode, but they're all pretty original. You can actually have a Star Trek network that just ran Star Trek. That's actually true. You know, you and, and it could, for like a month, not repeat. And a month, a lot more than. Yeah. It's funny, and I think well, there was a time well, you could have seen that, good. but now with streaming and stuff, something like that will never happen because you can create your own well, Star Trek Netflix. network yeah. by just going on Amazon or Netflix where all the right. things right. are available right. and just boom, boom, boom. You know what, you know what would be really interesting now? The photo novel. <laughs> You've heard it here first. Let's do it. Yeah, Geek presents <laughs> the Seriously. return of the photo novel. You know what the fuck? Bring back Mandalay Productions. You know? <laughs>